Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alejandro de Alba, I'm Campo Manes, and uh, we're here together virtually to learn a little bit more about um, the telemedicine options uh, in our pediatric ophthalmology practice. We were planning on presenting part of this webinar at our workshop at the uh, now cancel um, APOS meeting. Um, so when things started to change dramatically about two weeks ago, we thought it would be a good idea to share some of what we had prepared already with you. And as things continue to change, we receive uh, many questions from different people all over the world trying to share their experience, lessons from people from Spain and all over the United States that have been using um, telemedicine already for uh, adults or business post-op assessments or uh, after Botox injections and follow-up of uh, patients uh, in remote areas for pediatric ophthalmology care, as well as people who just were rapidly instituting their protocols in their own clinics. So I really want to thank everybody to today for being here, uh, especially um, the presenters that I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, despite the chaos and all the and all the work that I'm sure they they have now um, created for themselves in their own institutions, they took time to put together this information that hopefully will be of value to all APOS members that are trying to do their best to continue to take care of um, children and adults with strabismus. It is certainly a uh, very challenging time, and we wanted to make sure that we reviewed um, the options that um, <clears throat> will, will allow you to um, hopefully institute some of these tools. This presentation will be recorded. However, keep in mind that the information that we will be showing is rapidly changing and things will probably continue to evolve as we adapt to this new normal. So um, please just make sure that you check with your own institutions and continue to review the regulatory um guidance so that um as things change we can stay up up to date we'll have time um we'll have plenty of time hopefully at the end for questions and answers so uh, we're not going to pause between presenters after they give uh, their information if you do have questions use the question box and um we will be collating all those questions and at the end we will have the speakers answer as many of those as possible um scott is my audio not working uh no we're just getting that question a bit so i'm sending that to the audience oh sorry okay um so today um the speakers include uh, manasa indoram who's an assistant professor of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at ucsf She's been researching the topic for our own telemedicine program here at UCSF for the last several weeks. And she's going to be talking about the different telehealth platforms. Ankur Shah, who's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and the physician advisor for Boston Children's Hospital virtual visit program, who is probably one of the most experienced persons in our group. He's been doing telemedicine for over three years, and I'm sure he had a lot of great tips to share with us. Evan Silverstein, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at Children's Hospital of Richmond, who, as you all know, developed the nine gates application that we all love and, and use and has a an, uh, very um, deep interest in the applications of technology in ophthalmology. He will be reviewing uh, visual acuity applications, their future and integration. And Dr. Michael Rapka, who is a professor of ophthalmology and pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the American Academy of Ophthalmology Medical Director of Governmental Affairs. As we all know, he has extensive knowledge in regulatory and compliance issues and will be helping us with some of the billing and compliance issues uh, with information from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Hopefully all this information will allow us to understand and navigate the system as, as I said, while well, we do our best to continue to provide care for our patients. Um, today, we're gonna be reviewing some of the uh, platforms, those that are open access versus um, the ones that uh, are fee for service, um, their accessibility, uh, options uh, for remote visual acuity testing and uh, other evaluations, as well as pre-consultation, um, preparedness that you may want to do over with your patients 
We will be reviewing the billing and regulatory issues and we'll have time for questions and answers. We won't be covering other things, that, but you may want to consider um, the systems for triaging patients for upcoming cancellations, as well as a wrap, ramping up schedule when the times come. Um, many places have been creating priority lists and categorizing patients, and this will be up to each individual provider to come up with their, with their system, as, um, as well as to assess capacity for new patients and follow up after um, things normalize. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to invite Dr. Manasa Indoram to start her presentation. Okay. I'm Give it a minute for my PowerPoint to load. There we go. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This, I'm Monica Indoram calling here from San Francisco. It's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, I did have been doing a lot of research on telemedicine, um, mostly out of necessity over the past two weeks. So I'm excited to share with you some of what I've learned. Specifically today, I'll be talking about um, different platforms that are available for us to be conducting our telemedicine appointments. Um, when it comes to sort of the main definition of what telemedicine is, the Centers for Medicare and Medicare, uh, Medicaid Services has defined it as the exchange of medical information from one site to another through electronic communication to improve a patient's health. Due to the COVID-19 public health crisis though, Medicare has expanded its payments for telemedicine services. So now we can actually use telemedicine to replace office and hospital visits in any setting, including from a patient's own home and from our home as well. Prior to this pandemic, the telemedicine services that were reimbursable were much more limited. There are three main types of telemedicine visits that are available to us. The first is our video and audio visits. This is also known as the Medicare telehealth visit. This type of visit we can use for both new and established patients. The second type of telemedicine visit are telephone visits. Um, this is also known as, quote, virtual check-ins. These types of visits can only be used for patients that are established to your practice. The third type are email or secure messaging through your medical record system. This is also known as e-visits. This also has to be uh, used only for established patients. And one important note is that the patients actually have to initiate the communication in order for this to be a billable service. So I'll go through briefly some of the platforms for both the video and telephone visits. So video visits are defined as an interactive audio and video telecommunication system that permits real-time communication between the provider and the patients at home. Um, due to the COVID-19 crisis, Medicare now considers these types of visits the same as in-person visits. So therefore they're paid at the same rate as regular in-person visits when using E&M coding. Um, and just to reiterate, when you have new patient visits, this is the only way that you can actually charge for your visits, when you have simultaneous audio and video communication. When it comes to video platforms, beforehand, these video visits needed to have been done through HIPAA compliant platforms, which your practice or the hospital that you're working for would have had to contract with and pay for. So these included Zoom for Healthcare, VC, and Doxini Pro, amongst many others. However, during the COVID public health crisis, the um, Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights has decided that it will waive penalties for HIPAA violations against any healthcare provider that's serving patients in good faith through everyday communication technologies such as face, FaceTime or Skype. So in that vein, since many of us probably don't have 
uh, contracted video visit services already through our hospitals and our practices, I wanted to go through six different types of free platforms that are readily available to all of us. The first of which is FaceTime. So here's an example of a uh, visit that I am doing um, via FaceTime. And here, FaceTime is something that is very familiar to all of us. It's very user-friendly and it's accessible to all patients if they have Apple devices. Another pro for FaceTime is that it allows for unlimited calls between Apple devices, as long as you're on Wi-Fi. You can add multiple people onto the call as long as everyone has Apple devices. The major cons for FaceTime is that patients will have access to your personal number. Unfortunately, there's no way to conceal your personal number when using FaceTime. You cannot use FaceTime if both parties do not have some sort of Apple device. You cannot share your screen if you want to show the patient something. Um, you know, sometimes this is very helpful if you have a young patient and you want to screen share a video or something so that they have a fixation target. And you cannot record, save, or share the video. The next uh, form of video visit that's available to us now is WhatsApp. This is very similar to FaceTime in that it's very user-friendly for uh, individuals who are very familiar with WhatsApp. Here you can make calls between different devices such as iPhone and Androids. And again, you have unlimited calls between WhatsApp accounts through Wi-Fi. Here too, you can add multiple people onto the call so long as everyone has WhatsApp. But again, patients will have access to your personal number. You cannot use it unless both parties have WhatsApp. You cannot share your screen and you cannot record or save the video. Skype is another um, uh, platform that we might be able to use for free. Here, you, again, you can make phone calls um, and video visits between different devices, such as iPhone and Androids. Again, the, there's unlimited calls that are available between Skype accounts. You can add multiple people onto the call so long as they are all Skype users. Here you can share your, your computer screen with patients. And one thing that's interesting you can see in this video is that there is the option for closed captioning. I will warn you though, it is a bit delayed, um, but it does work well. And so it's an option for patients that have hearing impairments. Here you can record and save your videos as well. The major cons, again, with Skype is that it is linked to your personal phone number, so patients will have access to that. Um, you cannot use the video part of Skype unless both you and the patient have a Skype account. And so unfortunately, Skype has grown a little bit um, out of vogue in the last several years, so it might be a little more unfamiliar to many users. Google Hangout is something that's become much more popular nowadays amongst groups of people. Um, here you can send a patient a link to your meeting so they will not have access to your personal phone number. With Google Hangout, you can make an unlimited number of Hangouts over Wi-Fi and you can add multiple people to your call and share your computer screen as well. But the major cons are that you cannot use the video function unless everyone has a Google account and the Hangouts app if the patients are using them, um, if they're trying to communicate with you on their smartphone device. In order to have multiple patients scheduled throughout the day, you would need to start a new meeting for each patient, so it could get a little cumbersome. Unfortunately, you cannot record or save the video conversation on Google Hangouts. The next platform I wanted to discuss is DocSeeMe. This is a platform that's available through Doximity. Um, the major pro with this is that you can access anyone on any device so long as it has internet and a camera. So you can call from your computer to your patient's phone or vice versa. Again, you can send a link to your meeting so that the patient will not have access to your personal phone nor your email. You have unlimited one-on-one -on -one calls available through the free version of DocSeeMe. One interesting feature is that it has what's called a virtual waiting room. So you can schedule multiple patients throughout the day and then have them wait in the waiting room while you accept each one. Um, it is HIPAA compliant. The major cons for the free version of DocSeeMe is that you unfortunately cannot add a third party, for example, an interpreter to your call, unless you upgrade to the pro version. You cannot share your computer screen as well unless you upgrade, um, nor can you record, save, or share your video. And then finally, the last video platform I wanted to go through was Zoom. Um, Zoom as well can access anyone on any device as so long as it has internet and a camera. Here too, you send a link to your meeting. 
Um, so patients will not have access to your personal phone or your email. You can have unlimited one-on-one -on -one calls with patients throughout the day. You can add a third party to any of your calls, but this is limited to 40 minutes per each meeting. There is a virtual waiting room feature on Zoom as well, so you can schedule multiple patients throughout the day and accept patients when you're ready to take the next one. You can share your computer screen with patients, even with the free version, and you can record and save your video call as well. Then this is a HIPAA compliant platform similar to DocSeeMe. The cons with the free version are that group calls, so those that have more than three parties are limited to 40 minutes a day unless you upgrade to the healthcare version or the pro version. And you cannot dial out to a phone line. So if your um, interpreter doesn't have the ability to connect through a link with internet, you wouldn't be able to do call them directly on their phone unless you upgrade to the healthcare version. So here's just a basic chart where the different features of each of these different platforms and um, which platform sort of checks on checks most of the boxes here. Um, this is going to be available to you in the handout so you can go through, but ultimately whatever is the easiest for you to access and for your patients to access would be the platform of choice for your practice. So briefly, I wanted to just go through um, a few different platforms for telephone visits as well. So just to reiterate again, telephone visits can only be billable if you do them with established patients to your practice. You have to spend a minimum of five minutes on the telephone call and document this in order for this to be billable. The call cannot be related to an appointment or a procedure that was done in your office within the last week. And you cannot bill if you're recommending an in-office appointment the next day or even um, quote unquote the next available appointment. When it comes to platforms, um, free platforms for telephone visits, one simple way is to add star six seven before your number. And so your phone number will show up as a private number to your patients. However, many patients don't respond to unknown or private numbers. So another option is to create a Google Voice account so you have a separate number that's, that's being shared with your patients. And then my favorite actually is to use the Doximity dialer um, on the Doximity application. Um, for this, your patient will actually see your office number when you call them. And so you can set that number to whichever number you want. And so if you have multiple offices, you can toggle back and forth between which office you want the patient to see. So in summary, um, it seems that many restrictions for telemedicine have been lifted due to the COVID public health crisis. So now we have the ability to use readily available and free software and applications for telemedicine efforts, both for our video and our telephone encounter, encounters. Some, um, there are some helpful features with the pro versions of these platforms, but you certainly don't need them because the free versions have plenty functionality. And um, I would urge you to check in with your groups and your hospitals to see if they already have a telehealth platform with which they're contracted, because then you can just use that. Thank you. So thank you so much to the APOS committee for putting this together and uh, for inviting us to be here. I think I'm gonna to talk today about the virtual visit in ophthalmology and give you some of our experiences. These experiences are really the collective experiences of our entire group here. And without them, there is no way that we could have done the types of visits that I'm gonna show you. And hopefully this will spur some innovation among all of us and some best practice sharing among all of us so that we can get better at these things for our patients. Uh, I do have uh, one disclosure. I do get some salary support from the Boston Children's Hospital Innovation and Digital Health Accelerator. They support our virtual visit program. And uh, so perhaps that's a conflict of interest. Um, Anchor, well, this is Scott. I'm sorry, I'm breaking in. Um, do you want to um, relaunch your PowerPoint? Because it's um, only showing a portion of it right now. Oh, interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll do. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Is that any better? That's great. Thank you. Great. So uh, in this presentation, we'll break it down to the best practices, five case examples, and then a conclusion. So there are four key aspects to doing a good virtual visit. The first is to have good lighting. Natural light is ideal. Auxiliary lighting, such as from an iPhone or from an Android phone, or even from a tabletop lamp is, is okay. And the most important thing is to avoid backlighting so that you don't create shadows on the areas of the face that you actually want to see. Step two is to speak very clearly. We know that there's loss of fidelity across a microphone and then definitely across the, the internet itself. And so trying to understand what we are saying is critical. If you want the patients to understand, you need to speak slowly and you need to enunciate. In addition, you must use a stable surface. So the device that you're using and the device that the patient is using should be placed such that the camera is at eye level. Having that stable surface will improve your resolution because many of the pixels that are in the background and not changing will not need to be refreshed. It will maximize the use of your bandwidth. It will give you the best resolution of the image that you wanna see, as well as the movements that you wanna see in that virtual visit. And finally, look at the camera. When you're talking to the patients, have that idea that you're looking them in the eye, but actually looking the camera in the eye. This will create that emotional connection that we often get when sitting down to counsel a parent after we've seen their child in the office. So once you have these best practices in mind, you can do the examination. You just have to be innovative. And so take this image here of David Hunter, my chief, using Donald Duck to get a child to look at the screen and to understand the corneal light reflex and see if the eyes are straight. We hope these case examples will highlight some of these ideas that have come across from all of our talking internally and help you guys get started on your own virtual visits. So let's take a new strabismus consult that we just did last week. So the chief complaint here was a child with the right eye crossing. So he's a two-year-old boy. It started about a month ago. And now mom is reporting that it's worsening. We decided to do a virtual visit to avoid exposing them to coming into the office because as you all know, we get so many consults for pseudostrabismus. Our examination though, very quickly showed that he did have an intermittent esotropia as shown in the image to the bottom right. And I took a maneuver that was taught by one of my colleagues to do a doll's head maneuver. And I asked mom to, to have him look at his image and try to turn the head. With this, it sort of worked. And then I screen shared a video of Elmo and that worked a little better. And I thought there was good abduction, but given his young age and given the potential for missing, let's say a retinoblastoma or a cataract or something worse, I decided to bring him in for a same day evaluation. The evaluation itself confirmed the intermittent exotropia and the poor control, the loss of binocularity, as well as a refraction of plus five. So in this case, it was a good outcome. I put him in glasses and I didn't wanna wait four months until this outbreak is over to start those glasses in this young child. So the pearl here is that new patient complaints can be triaged for concerning findings. And those concerning findings can then be kicked up into a actual visit in the office or into reassurance for the parent and a follow-up appointment in four months to get the details. Let's take a corneal abrasion. So this is a, a patient that is age 15 months that my colleague did last, last week. Um, he has a seventh nerve palsy from neurological disease and is also immunocompromised. The corneal abrasion was quite large, and so he was discharged with antibiotics and a fluorescein strip. And the mother was instructed to download the iHandbook app with a blue light that could be turned on on the iPhone. The virtual visit was done uh, two day, uh, yesterday, and the epithelial defect resolved after mom uh, nicely sent us a picture showing the fluorescein on the surface of the eye. Now, obviously, she was very adept at doing this, uh, but this worked very nicely within the virtual visit itself. The plan here was to discontinue the antibiotics, to reassure mom, and to continue the lubrication given the seventh nerve palsy on that right side. And the pearl here is that parents can help you with the examination with household items such as their phone and apps that are available online. And Evan is gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the apps that you can use for visual acuity, which I'm gonna skip through uh, many of these case examples. Let's take another uh, example, an open globe injury. 
there's no way we can do this virtually, right? Well, maybe. Um, a follow-up evaluation after the open globe injury was exactly what we had to do last Friday. So this kid is age four. He was misdiagnosed with a corneal abrasion about three weeks ago. He then presented to the ophthalmology office uh, in the local area and was diagnosed with an open globe injury that had been missed, severe inflammation, fibrin in the anterior chamber, and was started on prednisolone and then referred to us for further management. He's now presumed COVID-19 infected. So we had known that he had a cold and mom took him to the pediatrician, had every other test done. And the pediatrician said, well, we don't have a test for the COVID-19, but he's got all the symptoms you should isolate. And so we were forced to do this virtual visit. Well, it turns out he was opening his eyes better. He had less redness, he had less photophobia. And so this was very reassuring to me that the initial plan with the prednisolone started and the moxifloxacin that we had added uh, was working and that there wasn't a severe endophthalmitis here. And we knew that the globe had self-sealed already. Well, when he looked down, we had this beautiful natural light coming from a window to his right and our left. And I could see the corneal laceration over here. And I could see that there wasn't much injection around that area in the limbal zone. When he looked to the left, I could actually see his cataract. And this screenshot actually does not do justice to the video feed that I was able to get. Um, but it's almost like when you're trying to do a Rizzuti sign for a keratoconus patient, that oblique illumination allowed me to see the cataract that we had known about. But it also allowed me to see in both of these images that the pupils were now round. If you recall, there was a fibrinous membrane across the pupil distorting the pupil. And I could see that this was largely gone and I was left with just the cataract. So it reassured me without exposing others and myself to a potential COVID patient that we were going in the right direction. I tapered the prednisolone down from every hour. I continued the moxifloxacin. I'll see him by a virtual visit in two weeks. Hopefully he'll be better and then we'll bring him back into the office and deal with the aftermath of this globe injury. So the Pearl again is natural lighting and a stable device. She had, mom had put it on a desktop, were critical and this oblique illumination. I've been doing this for three and a half years. I didn't even realize that I could see something like this. It was happenstance as he looked to the left that I was able to see that pupil very clearly and the, and the lens clearly. Now, obviously I knew what his examination should show me because I had seen him in the office before, but using all of that ability or all of that knowledge to our advantage is helpful so that we can take care of patients virtually. Let's take another case of binocular surface graft versus host disease patient, uh, status post bone marrow transplant. He has severe dry eye. He was blinking incessantly. I started him on lubrication, it didn't work. I placed punctal plugs three weeks prior and now he reports that he feels better. He also had developed this intermittent exotropia with poor control and diplopia, probably from the irritation um, and maybe a, a tendency to have an exo deviation. On his examination, it was actually the bulbar conjunctival looked nice and white and quiet. I hadn't seen that in all my previous uh, appointments. I also noticed that he was no longer blinking incessantly. And when he pulled down his lower eyelid, I was actually able to see the punctal plug right here in nice position, ensuring that it was still there and, and seeing that our intervention with the punctal plug and the lubrication was working. I then asked him to do a self-cover test as he looked directly at the camera. And I was able to see that he had an exophoria and that when he removed the self-cover, uh, the binocular vision drove him back into alignment. When I asked him to look over the camera at a distance, I also saw that his control was excellent. His diplopia was resolved. And so this made me feel good. He's immunocompromised. He's doing better. The plugs are working. The lubrication's working. Follow up in four months, um, hopefully when we're a little bit past this crisis and he's safer to come out. The natural lighting again and stabilized device allowed that high resolution. Engaging the patient to pull down the lid also allowed us to see things that were critical to the examination. And finally, let's talk about orbital cellulitis. So this is status post orbital cellulitis, or sorry, orbital abscess drainage. It's a 15 year old. Um, he was admitted to the hospital, underwent drainage and uh, an endoscopic sinus surgery with our ORL colleagues. He still had significant ptosis on the right side and a lot of edema, but this was so much better than when he was discharged a week ago. He had full motility and we asked him to put his head back and looked at a worm's eye view. And we saw that his proptosis, which was still about three to four millimeters on discharge and about seven to eight millimeters initially 
had markedly improved and hadn't recurred. So our plan was to reassure the patient, continue the outpatient antibiotics. And the pearl here is that that worm's eye view can really help you. And that external exam, just looking at the patient can really tell you that he's doing well and that you don't need to bring him in and expose him. So again, follow best practices. Those are key. If you have those best practices in, you'll innovate and you'll be able to figure out how to get the information that you need and use that information that you have from your chart before and the examinations that you did before. Have a low threshold to bring a child in if the virtual visit uh, leaves you feeling a little bit uncertain or leaves the parent feeling uncertain. And then as we each learn how to do these visits and how to innovate, you know, share uh, with the APOS board, share with publications. And we couldn't have done this without the Boston Hospital Children, uh, sorry, Boston Children's Hospital virtual visit team, which is not even displayed here. And I'd like to give a shout out to Theodore Bo, who will be joining our ranks. He's a medical student that's been working with me for the last year and really helped organize a lot of this in, in this crisis situation. So thank you all. And uh, we'll be happy to, to show you our, our handout, which has a lot of these examination maneuvers outlined. We hope that you guys will add to that table that is in that handout. Good evening. Uh, my name is Evan Silverstein. I'm at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University at the Children's Hospital of Richmond, and I'll be talking to you about uh, visual acuity testing for telemedicine. <laughs> Uh, I have a couple of financial disclosures, uh, C-Vision LLC, I'm the owner, that's the app that we were talking about earlier, and I'm a consultant for Hillrom. So visual acuity in the office is what we strive for. It's the kind of the gold standard of checking vision for our children. We like it because we have trained technicians that are able to, um, excuse me, there. Uh, we have trained technicians that are able to um, test the vision reliably. We can patch an eye. We can watch while the child is um, getting their vision tested to make sure that it's reliable. And we get to choose the optotypes that are appropriate for the age of our child that's tested. So for telemedicine visual acuity, we can kind of take a page out of the pediatrician screening office um, book. And there's lots of different ways that we can check uh, visual acuity using ETDRS letters, um, crowding bars, HOTV, LIA symbols are the ones that are preferred um, these days. The tumbling E, the Landolf C, um, and the Allen pictures are have kind of full, fallen out of favor um, due to especially with the younger children lack of confusion or their confusion lack of spatial awareness um, and inability to perform some of these tests and so the ideal situation for telehealth is taking the pediatric exam room and trying to put it into the home to allow the parents to check vision prior to the visit with us. And so our goal is to mimic that vision and visual acuity test that we do in the office and do it at home. And there are some requirements that are needed in order for it to be a successful test that we can give and provide to all of our patients. And the first one is that it's got to be available to everybody. Um, you know, when you have some people on certain devices and other people on other devices or lack of device, um, you need to either have multiple um, options or have one that works for everybody. Uh, we also need the acuity check to be appropriate and um, accurate. So we know that we are testing what we want to be testing and we're testing it well. And it's got to be easy. Um, you have seen and interacted with patients and you know that it can be difficult and if the parents are the ones that are administering their test, it's got to be easy for them to perform as well. 
And so there's different methods of testing visual acuity. Um, people who know me know I am a technophile, uh, but there are um, paper charts available as well that may be the best um, option at this time for checking visual acuity for telehealth visits. So with paper acuity, um, for younger children, um, HOTV, um, Bob Arnold at ABCD Vision in Alaska has developed his way of checking vision with a, for his telehealth uh, visits using an HOTV column that can be made and folded at home. And this has been validated um, with one of the studies that was done in uh, 2017 comparing it to EDTRS. In older children, um, the, you can use Snellen uh, or other letters, AAO and All About Vision have put out um, acuity charts that can be printed out. Um, this is the one that is available on the AAO website, and this is the one that is available on the All About Vision website. So with the paper acuity, uh, the HOTV with Bob Arnold, um, you can uh, direct people to the, his website, and I'll have some links as well, um, but you print out this um, sheet here um, that is an eight and a half by 11, and there is a guide that says, you know, is this two and a half inches? And that ensures that the printer and everything is um, proportioned correctly. And then what you do is you fold it, and I'll do that really quick here. Excellent. <laughs> and so you, the parent will rotate and point and say, okay, now, which is this letter? And this is great because you can randomize it. If your child is memorized, what comes next? You can kind of put it behind your back. Um, and um, the lowest line is 2020 here. And then it also comes with a matching guide um, that you can print out as well. And these are the links, um, which will also be available in my handout that um, is provided. So paper acuity for older children, um, they, they absolutely can still do this uh, HOTV crowding bar um, test, or um, we can test with um, acuity letters. The interesting, and so again, here AAO is on the left and the All About Vision is on the right. And the AAO jumps from 2020 to 2030 to 2050. Um, so it, there are no 2025 or 2040, 2060 letters. For some reason, they left those off. I'm not sure why. Um, so the All About Vision one uh, does have uh, each individual step um, in the acuity line that may be um, better for these older children. So the other very important thing is standardization. We need, we want to make sure that we are testing what we want to be tested. Um, so um, the eye charts and the HOTV column are meant to be used at 10 feet or 120 inches. Um, this can be measured many different ways um, and you can provide all of the different ways to your families um, so they can measure that 10 feet because not everybody will have a tape measure, which was probably the ideal method. Um, you can also just take 11 sheets of printer paper and line them up end to end because um, 11 times 11 is 121, which gets you pretty close to that 10 feet. Um, then the other thing you can do is, since everybody loves apps, you can use apps. Um, in iOS, the I, iOS devices, uh, which are you know the iPhone SE and 6S or later, um, some iPads and some iPod Touches, they have this measure app where you can actually bring your phone around to uh, measure uh, the floor and you can measure 10 feet. And this is also um, Google, Google Measure on Android um, has these um, ways as well. Occlusion, um, you have to educate the parents. A lot of times with amblyopia checks, the parents will already have patches, so you can have them use that, that patch to occlude the eye or um, educate them to use their palm. Reporting is also important just so, you know, they can really do it any time before your examination. They can, you can educate them to do it a day before, so that way they're not scrambling uh, to have your acuity for you. 
or you can uh, do it right before, but you wanna make sure that they don't forget what the acuity is and sort of write it down and maybe even having a reliability scale to have the parents be honest with you to know you can trust this vision or I'm, I'm confident in my child versus, you know, I tried, but don't trust anything that I just told you. Um, and so I do have this in the handout as well, um, along with some directions um, that you can use. I have it as a Word doc so you can edit it for your practice, or if you don't like how I worded things, that's fine. So uh, electronic acuity is the other way to check uh, vision. There are many different apps out there, and I'm gonna go through um, a number of them. Um, and again, talk about what is uh, good and bad about these apps. Um, the first one is Go Check Kids. It's a screening app that is in uh, a lot of pediatricians' offices. Um, you may not, you may not know, but they also have an acuity screening as well, um, using HOTV and letters, um, where at five feet they do a matching game where you tilt the device side to side to uh, match it up and when it's correct you tilt the um, the phone forward and it registers as correct and it is uh, the method is from the i spy video game and has been validated um, in peer-reviewed uh, studies currently it is only available through their app uh, through their screening app um, but they are very um, interested in telemedicine um, and trying to have it available for um, through an in, uh, other app that you can download or your patients can download for iOS first and then moving to Android. And they're hoping to do that in the next um, coming weeks. I also did a um, study on this screening device having parents in my office uh, check the vision without any feedback from my medical student or myself on how to do it better to see what um, could actually be tested at home. Um, and so I tested the Go Check Kids um, versus um, HOTV amblyopia treatment study protocol on the MNS system. And the acuity at the top is the acuity as measured by the app and then um, the target graph shows what the acuity was on HOTV um, amblyopia treatment study. And I studied kids four to um, 18. And you can see that um, the HOTV crowding bar match um, is uh, about one line um, increased uh, from or better than what the GoCheck kids, um, but it is uh, pretty consistent throughout. Next is peak acuity. Um, they use a tumbling E boxed um, optotype and has a testing distance at two meters. Um, and sorry, I forgot to mention the GoCheck kit is, is five feet. It is only available on Android. Um, I've sent some emails to uh, Peak Acuity and they've said, you know, our, our, our population um, for users is mainly Android and they didn't have any interest at this moment um, to um, come out with iOS, but if you all want to inundate them with emails to tell them iOS is necessary too, I wouldn't be opposed. Um, this is validated as well and is available for free, and this uses the swipe method um, if it's uh, to say, okay, if the child points to this direction, you swipe on the screen and it acknowledges that as that as a correct answer. Um, the Jade Bio Visual Acuity Screener um, is validated. It is only available on Windows devices, and its testing distance is five feet, um, also available for free. iHandbook, uh, which is what was mentioned before that uh, also has some other testing um, protocols. They have different visual acuity methods, um, numbers, X's and O's, tumbling E, uh, land on C, and it's a near test at 14 inches. It is available on iOS and Android. Uh, it is not validated, and you can see the spacing is pretty broad um, between each optotype, and it is available for free, but you have to deal with those ads that you get every time you open up the app. Visual Acuity Charts is a app on iOS devices only. 
Um, and it's interesting because you can change the testing di distance from two, to, from two to six meters. You can change in the settings, you can change it from meters to feet if you would like. Um, and they have many different types of test optotypes, but it is single and there are no crowding bars or box. It is just a single optotype. So um, take that with a grain of salt as well. So looking at all of them together, there are lots of different apps right now, but there is no perfect app for visual acuity right now. Um, the reason why is because not all of them are available on any device. If it's available on Windows, it's not available on Mac. If it's available on iOS, it's not available on Android and vice versa. Um, and so this is going to be evolving very rapidly. Um, and hopefully we'll, be ha we'll, we'll have some other electronic methods that will be available for all users um, coming soon. Um, in the handout is what I am going to be sending to my patients. Um, via email initially um, to say why exactly we are doing what we're doing, um, go through the process of them uh, creating their own eye chart um, using the HOTV is the method that I'm going to be going, uh, the column is one I'm going to be going for first um, until the apps are available for everybody because I don't want to have contingency upon contingency upon contingency. And so this will be emailed out. Uh, there are links to the PDFs that they can print out at home. And then uh, also, if they can't be printed out, a, another option would be to send them this packet um, with the HOTV and um, iChart and the matching card, in addition to um, maybe even putting a patch in their little uh, care package as well. So I appreciate your time. Um, this is going to be evolving field in the electronic applications for checking visual acuity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later um, through here or through email, and I appreciate your time. So assuming my computer has gone up, and I'll assume Scott will tell me that I'm on or not, um, I've been given the task of at least bringing some of the coding and documentation guidelines to bear. Uh, as you know, none of this was created for the current situation. They were all made much more restrictive with the idea that CMS could pay for very little that went on in the telehealth sector. And although they've been under great pressure for many years, um, this pressure, of course, is extraordinary. As was mentioned at the top, uh, these this um, talk was prepared by um, myself and Sue Vishrilli over the weekend and edited until four o'clock this afternoon, uh, but is undoubtedly going to be changing tomorrow. In addition, every institution is doing their own spin and their own interpretation on, on the rules. And Administrator Verma today in a nationwide call at noon said to expect big changes in the program uh, by the end of this week or the beginning of next week. We assume that has to do with the billing of phone calls in Medicare. So overview, there are a number of changes that have happened. Uh, those include the HIPAA waiver, the site of service waiver. Um, for instance, you were never allowed to do this from home um, before it had to be in a physician office. And the inclusion of new patients are temporary provisions for this period. We don't know what will happen once this crisis period is over. Most rules you're hearing about are Medicare rules. Commercial coverage varies. It varies widely as far as we're following uh, people, uh, but likely moving to the same place because there's a lot of pressure from the administration on the commercial carriers to follow suit. For instance, Medicare has said that you, might, you should charge a copayment, um, but you are allowed to waive it. That's something that's not typically allowed. And we understand the commercial carriers may do the same thing. CMS has given Medicaid programs permission to allow coverage and because they're state administered programs, 
those are going to change state to state. But I must emphasize, in all cases, the patient must be informed that a charge will be sent to the insurance company. Uh, this is new for the patients as well, and will create a whole lot of uh, anxiety or discomfort by the families if we don't do that. Licensure. Requirements are being relaxed, but nowhere near as lax as the media suggests, and they also vary widely by state. Uh, two URLs from two different organizations, the Federation of State Medical Boards above and the Center for Connected Health Policy below, are trying to keep on top of that. But for instance, even today, uh, sitting in Maryland, I could not provide telehealth services to a patient in Pennsylvania, Virginia, or the District of Columbia. So right now, I would have to do a traditional phone call and do it as that. On March 23rd, CMS released a frequently asked questions on provider enrollment, uh, those things your institutions or your staff should keep um, aware of, and toll-free hotlines are available as well to answer questions related, related to COVID-19 enrollment requirements. That's specifically related to docs who are trying to be able to provide this service where they weren't doing uh, services before in a particular state or region. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, this was mentioned, the HIPAA relaxation. This is what makes all of this really possible outside of the cumbersome EHR portals. And so any non-public facing remote communication platform that Indasa talked about at the top are allowed. Just keep up to date on what's going on with those particular portals. Um, and of course, the ones that are not allowed. Who can submit claims under these programs? The rules that Medicare is disseminating apply to MDs, DOs, and ODs. There are a different set of codes for physician assistants and nurse practitioners uh, that you can find on the um, Academy website. Uh, we've created two documents, one on, one on coding and billing, and one on how to uh, for the how should I say, for the solo practitioner who just turned FaceTime on for the first time this week. So our options for reporting these services uh, include phone communication, electronic or digital or online communication would be its synonymous uh, entries, and then examination via the allowed uh, audio video platforms that have been uh, shown and described. What should your staff do? Uh, the staff really should be researching the practices of the top five commercial payers to learn what you should be doing for those payers. Very different than the adult ophthalmology practice, which can rely on Medicare uh, to, and to set most of its policies. Uh, they need to notify the parent that there will be a charge to insurance for the telemedicine visit. And actually, you have to confirm insurance just like you would for any other encounter. Um, then obtain the best contact information uh, that might you might be able to use, whether it be phone, email only, or the platforms. And notify the parent when the physician will be in contact uh, with one of those uh, communication options. I should have said, the parent needs to agree to this, and that's sort of the outreach. Most of this was rules were written with the assumption uh, it would be an established patient and the parent or the patient would be contacting the doctor. Obviously, the staff need to coordinate that so it happens seamlessly uh, and avoiding as much telephone tag as possible. Liability. Um, the best practice is to obtain consent and remind the patient uh, that this is not the same as face-to-face. -face. Um, and you can see one example here, patient initiated request for care and consented to care by phone. Um, you know, obviously, I think patients understand why we're doing it, uh, but this is a protection that's recommended. So telephone calls established, uh, initiated by an established patient, parent, or guardian. Uh, they're not billable, and we'll reiterate what was mentioned at the top of this uh, webinar. Uh, if the phone call results in a decision to see the patient within the next day, it's not billable. 
Um, if it occurs seven days after an appointment, it's not billable. Uh, if performed within the global surgical period, it's not billable. Or if it takes less than five minutes, there's simply no code for a phone call that goes less than five. Uh, the codes for telephone calls are here. They're in the CPT book, of course, and you can see they're time derived. So it's medical discussion for five to 10 minutes or 11 to 20 and so forth. And that's how you would choose which of those. Um, for telephone calls, I sure hope most people are not in the um, half hour category. E-visits. So e-visits encompass, encompasses anything beyond a telephone. So the computer um, or FaceTime, a digital program running through the tel through a cell, tel cell phone would not fit a, um, a phone call, but rather it would be an e-visit, a different code set. Um, and it counts for all of the contacts within seven days. So it may be continuous or not continuous, uh, but it's a once per seven days uh, billing opportunity. Um, they cannot be used for scheduling appointments or conveying test results. Those are not, um, those are generally just a telephone call that's probably not billable. And it's not billable if the conversation constitutes a post-op exam. So while it's really a great idea to do post-ops with all of these methods, they still count as post-ops and are not uh, excluded from the uh, surgical bundle. Telemedicine exams, of course, is what most people are interested in because they pay, um, well, at least are proposed and in Medicare are paying the current uh, fee schedule uh, value. Uh, they still are much more involved and probably much more time consuming. Um, you use one of the new or one of the established patient codes from the E&M system. Uh, telemedicine exams cannot be using the tech code, uh, the one, the 211 code, nor do I visit codes qualify here uh, in spite of some protestations we made a few years ago. Um, and office consultations uh, codes do qualify um, if you have a, an insurance company that still remembers what those numbers mean. Now, if you're using these codes, you have to go back and review the documentation guidelines published uh, more than 20 years ago in 1997 that describes what elements are necessary for each level. Um, so in general, levels four and five will be pretty much impossible to achieve with a telemedicine exam with the technology we have today because we can't examine the posterior segment. And it is, essentially too hard to get the um, examination to that level. So it does, it, it, we simply can't choose those unless we use time. So uh, time, and I'm gonna go back. For level one, it's 10 minutes. For level two, it's 20 minutes. And for level three, it's 30 minutes and so forth. Um, so that you can use the documentation guidelines for the three parts of the exam or time, but do you do have to record that if you're reporting that code. Um, they need to have real-time audio video in both directions, just as Indasa showed the various platforms and Anker demonstrated. Uh, use the 1997 E&M documentation guidelines uh, to determine the code level. Um, for the moment, the place of service is two, and Medicare and other payers may require the modifier 95. And the reason I say may on these things is because just like us, the payers are trying to figure out exactly how these should be reported and how to keep the claims from being rejected. There are some other things that you can use. There's the Medicare quick check-in uh, G2012. This is a five to 10 minute uh, check-in via telephone or other communications device with a Medicare beneficiary. Originally, this was the only way the Medicare beneficiaries could participate. Those other codes were not in play uh, and was not billable uh, when shorter than five minutes. But this is only for the Medicare beneficiary. Uh, other people will use the um, 
uh, 421 and 441 series of codes. Um, the video or image review, uh, there's also a Medicare code for that G2010, so that if somebody sends you a video and you can review that video, you can report, but it's unlikely that a non-Medicare carrier will, um, will, will agree with or will actually even figure out what G2010 is. So not a good place to go. You're better off using the electronic or e-visit codes for that. Um, there are an overview, the last two slides here, which are been sent as the handout, uh, which just describe how to report these on two pages for the office staff. Um, paper eye charts at AO.org. Um, Evan had one of those. There is a, um, a pediatric chart up as well. Uh, and I have no idea why they did that other than they were, uh, why they spaced them the way they did other than they were created in 2016. Um, coding advice is updated daily. Uh, that includes um, code selections for PAs and nurse practitioners and for anyone that wants to do skilled nursing facility billing or nursing home care. Uh, information is there as well. And as I mentioned, the telemedicine primer, how to use the e &M codes for the um, FaceTime novice was also posted um, yesterday. Uh, thanks very much for your attention um, this evening. Sorry we're doing this as well. So um, Alejandra, back to you. Thank you very much, everybody. So we have a lot of questions and I'm gonna to try to um, direct them, but again, um, everybody feel free to jump in if you have uh, answers and some of the uh, audience is already sharing other great um, things that they're doing and apps. So uh, we have a lot of resources here uh, for, for the APUS community. So um, the first uh, question, um, I think it's for you, Ankur. Um, what uh, platform are you using um, that allows for such great uh, screenshots? And if you can remind or explain a little bit further the eye handbook and the blue lights that you're using. Sure, so the platform that we are using is developed by a small company in Cambridge, Massachusetts called SBR. Um, I don't think it's one of the large players out there, but it has been working for us uh, for the past you know, three and a quarter years. Um, it is a commercial entity. I don't think it would be very quick to upload. Um, although you could go to their website, it's called sbrhealth.com and uh, contact them if, if you're interested. Um, I would think that the, probably the lift is, is easier on some of the other platforms that we've seen. Um, as far as the iHandbook, you know, actually this is news to me and I just learned about it yesterday through one of my colleagues. And uh, I actually downloaded the app just just today to, to figure it out and there's a lot of different things in there and I, you know maybe many of you know this but one of them is the blue light and i'm going to show you guys uh what it looks like um so here's here's the app if you can see it and uh down here is this um is this blue light and so you just take that and then shine it towards the light it uh, towards the the eye itself and and that gives you the blue coloration and the fluorescein glow that we saw uh, on that patient image. Thank you. Um, I think for Mike or Manasa, uh, any sense of how long this uh, bill, this waiver will will last? Um, so the the administration is saying till the end of the crisis, but I believe in the. I have to look at the handout, but I'm pretty sure the dates are uh, through the end of the year. But um, all right, so the initial date was January 31st. Um, I will look, but it's going to be many months. Yeah, I think the verbiage is all said the, during the pandemic. And so I think once there's some sort of statement by the federal government that the crisis is over, then we can have a little bit more caution about using these non-HIPAA compliant platforms. And there's a question about what does public facing mean? And are there any codes for orthoptists? Um, well, there are no codes for orthoptic services uh, that are allowed on telehealth. Um, and I forgot the first question. Uh, what does public facing mean? So one that, um, so Facebook would be public facing, for instance. So something that, um, um, oh, God, there are a whole bunch of those that. Um, 
I have to look up the names. So something that's shared with um, the general community or the public that's not necessarily a secure private messaging. So while you can't use Facebook, you one of the things that um, the HHS has said that you could use is Facebook Messenger because that's a private communication between two individuals. So other forms of social media such as Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok or whatever everyone else is using nowadays is not something that we would be able to, to use to conduct telemedicine appointments. All right. Um, other question, billing question for uh, Mike Rupka. Can you build 99422 plus G20110 together? Or is G20110 part of the EV sit? So we don't think so. Um, there's no, this is a great question. It came up yesterday. The NCCI edits or don't include it because the first, the 994 two or four series weren't actually Medicare benefits. Um, but the presumption is that you would be reporting the same service and you shouldn't do that. So build a patient for one of those and um, be thankful there's a payment, I suppose. Evan, um, a question for you. Um, they want to know if the different visual acuity apps account for the different phone or, or padlet sizes. And can you run the Jave vision screener on your desktop and share screen with your patient to check vision? So that is somewhat the the unknowns on the on some of the apps whether or not they are calibrated correctly. The peak um, you do measure on the screen the size of an E at the beginning to make sure that it is appropriate. Um, and if it is, then you give it a little check mark and you're good to go through. Um, the Go Check Kids they will be in their future. Uh, um, programs, they said that they are absolutely knowing the importance of calibration and will uh, absolutely look into making different sizes for the different screens. And the other question about the Jabe uh, Visual Acuity uh, Screener, it's um, unfortunately I haven't been able to play with it um, since I have um, Mac computers, but my guess is that if you have to use a application where you can share screens like Zoom, um, and so you wouldn't be able to use FaceTime or um, other things where you can't do that, and then you'd have to run through the calibration with the patient at that time because their screen resolution and size will be different than yours. And when you share a screen, they might not have it as full screen. And so there's a lot of things that you have to do in order to make it um, good and appropriate. Any of the other apps um, that, that you tested um, ask for the um, size of the optotype other than Peak? Um, just, no. They just okay. give it to you and say it's probably right. Most of these apps are for older kind of verbal or cooperative kids. Um, anybody aware of anything for the younger or nonverbal children, of course, you can print a, a matching card. I'm aware of uh, another app called Peekaboo Peek Vision, which by the same makers as Speak, that it's a similar to a teller, to a teller card that you project on a on a Padlet, but also right now with a limited um, distribution and accessibility. But I've also contacted them and they're they're working on that, so maybe coming out soon. But any any other recommendation for the younger children? Um, so, you know, with, in my office, I found that, um, the kids, um, are just as good at doing HFTV match as they are at Allen, um, or at other things like that. And so, um, with a lot of these, the HFTV matching would be, um, sufficient. Um, and then there was another question that I'll answer right now, but, or the, that Stephen Thornquist said. Uh, that the iHandbook does, in fact, recognize your device and scales to it. So thank you for, for that. One quick thing, uh, sorry, one quick thing to add to, to younger children. So don't forget about the fix and follow. Um, having a sibling, having a parent take a toy that they like and allowing them to follow it back and forth. Um, also occlusion um, and seeing how they object to occlusion. These are things that we use in the office that we objectively document that can really help you if there is a difference in inclusion between the two eyes. And the other thing that one of my colleagues pointed out just in the last week is that even if the, the near card that you show or that you screen share is not calibrated, 
perhaps with our amblyopic patients, we could have them use the, the good eye and the amblyopic eye and get a relative difference between the two eyes. Um, and so I think that might be an, another way that we can gauge at least how our amblyopia therapy is working. And depending on how long we're in this crisis mode, uh, if you have two or three visits after some patching or after some atropine, you may actually be able to gauge that there is improvement or not. Absolutely. One question. If I, mention, yeah, if, if I could mention one of the things about all of the visual acuity tests that we're talking about is none of them were, were actually registered for clinical care. Uh, these are all patient um, health, quality of health care uh, is how they were waived into the market. And so when we ask them to be as good as our office testing, they just never were designed to do that. Um, perhaps we need to have them designed or they need to look at the regulatory side uh, in the future. However, some of them have been validated against other other tests. And you know that's one of the strengths of those that have some uh, articles yeah. behind them. Yeah, validated but passing regulations actually turns out to be different. Right. Uh, Ankur, another question for you is about um, how you check uh, visual acuity on your cellulitis um, patient. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I haven't been as tech savvy as Evan's been <laughs> and, and using those apps. Um, so the, the cellulitis patient was actually pretty easy. He was in his bedroom and I just asked him to tell me what was across the, um, across the room. And he found a clock and he was reading the clock with his unaffected eye and then just covered the eye, lifted the lid and told me that the clock looked relatively similar. So it's a, it's a subjective measure, um, but I used his worry or lack of worry to give me reassurance. And the fact that I had tested his vision on discharge about seven days prior and known that it was equal between the two eyes um, and perfect. So again, I think you have to have a low threshold. So we need to see emergency and urgent patients. The virtual visit, as has been talked about by all of us, is a way for us to continue to care for our patients, but it's not a substitute for what we do in the office, at least with today's technology. And so have that low threshold, use your clinical intuition because we're all experienced, that clinical intuition will guide you on whether this is urgent, emergent, and whether that patient needs to come in. Uh, another question that is coming up, and, and, and I think we should address the, the disparities that this will create and the health inequities as, you know, patients obviously with more access to technology and more tech savvy are going to be able to do these visits a lot more. So a couple of questions that came up was in, in patients with a, a limited English or, or English as a second language, what are the options in terms of involving interpreter services? Another question was, how would you recommend um, counseling uh, parents that have a limited um, you know, technological uh, expertise or that do not comprehend easily? Um, when it comes to the first part of that question about involving interpreter services, I think one of the, the, the points that I was trying to make with the different platforms is that trying to pick one that enables you to have a group-based discussion or have a third party involved However, you know, way you're able to do that with the interpreting services that you have available in your practice or in your hospital, I think that, that that's sort of the key for that. That's the reason why having that third party is so important. Um, you know, at UCSF here, we are contracted with Zoom for Healthcare. And one of the features that's available with Zoom, um, in addition to allowing a third party to enter a meeting, is that you can actually phone in the third party. So if they don't have internet access, you can phone them in through um, their regular phone line. I've done that several times already with some of my telehealth visits and it goes very seamlessly and very smoothly. Um, for telephone encounters also, that's something that you're able to do with most interpreting services. They're able to, you're able to call the interpreters and then have them call the patient directly. Um, that's something that's sort of always been a possibility with interpreting services via telephone. When it comes to counseling the patients in terms of how to understand how to use the software, that is definitely a challenge. I think that we're relying a lot on um, the younger generation sort of being tech savvy to begin with and having some familiarity with, with audio and visual based software in everyday life, like FaceTime, that they're sort of very comfortable with the video aspect of communication. But in terms of setting up things that they're not familiar with, like Zoom or DocVMe, um, it involves coordinated care from the staff who's establishing the visit. 
So there should be very clear instructions given in you know, all of the, the languages that you, uh, you know, the primary language for the patient. So we've had our instructions translated into Spanish and we're looking into translating it into Mandarin as well um, for the two major languages that we see here in San Francisco, having those sent out and making sure that the patient questions are answered. But I think one thing that would be really helpful is to have a staff member on standby to be able to help these patients um, with their IT difficulties. Um, Mike, um, other questions that are coming up are, can we bill for external photos and can you code for sensory motor exam? Um, well, you can code for sensory motor examination, but not done by telehealth. It's not allowed as a telehealth service, um, unfortunately. Uh, as far as billing for external photos, this crisis doesn't change payer policy on that. If there are already a payer that's actually paying you for it, they still will. Uh, if they're not, then this isn't going to change that. But you could uh, build a Medicare patient or these patients with one of the, either the G2012 or the 9, uh, 9421 for a code to discuss that photo, that you could do. Evan, a uh, question for you. How can we measure vision with Bob Arnold's HOTV printout if vision worse than 2060? Maybe bring testing distance to five feet? Yes, so there's a nice video that uh, Bob Arnold put out um, that I have a link to in the handout uh, that you can send to your patients and kind of runs through the test. And so um, basically, yes, you have the distance and um, double the um, vision, so. Uh, Mike, what kind of documentation is needed for telemedicine visits? Do you create a same note as you would normally do? It depends on your, your record system. In Epic, in theory, you convert it to a video visit um, and it does all this boilerplate stuff to say that the patient is acknowledged and, you know, it goes through a lot of complicated stuff. Um, you could also make a regular encounter and just put in some notes that it's a video visit and record the time. Um, and it's, it's going to be e your own EMR specific, uh, and many of them will probably not be that different. Uh, but they were all created before to put all kinds of barriers to doing this with the difficult system. I, I noticed uh, that no one on the EPIC sites on this call noted that they were using the EPIC system to do their, their video visits um, because it's much harder. And so the, the answer is use what you have available to you or document that it's a video visit and it's done because of the COVID-19 uh, relaxation. I think it's reasonable to document that for the auditors who are uncertainly going to come and look at this stuff, uh, I hate to say. And, and another just, question. Oh, sorry. Could I add one, one quick thing to that? Be descriptive about how you obtained the information that you did. So in that orbital cellulitis patient, I described exactly how, what he was looking at and what he described. And so I think that will help us on the back end that we are testing these things. It's just different from what we do in the office. Yeah, Encore, that's a very good idea, particularly for visual acuity and other things that um, just showing you did that bullet point. Uh, again, those of you that don't remember these guidelines, they're just, you have to check off a certain number of boxes um, to get qualified. And on that same topic, they're asking if it's reasonable to think that you can meet a level three billing for telemedicine, not based on time. So without telling you what to do, I think it's very hard to do that um, and get the detailed examination, but it's possible uh, if you can manage to do fields and motility and external uh, and uh, an anterior segment pen light exam, uh, you get enough elements uh, to at least get the exam through. But remember on an established patient, you only have to meet the criteria on level on two out of three categories so that their history and medical decision making can get you to level three, certainly on established patients. And when do you think you will start seeing the reimbursements? When you say reimbursement, well, that's going to be up to the individual carriers what they're going to do. Medicare, these should fly through. Assuming they're coded, there's no real change. Um, that they're seeing. 
Another question is about the, the place where you can conduct this. Can you be at, at home? And somebody said. Yeah. yeah, that was a relaxation of the rule. Um, came up also on the national call today that a few institutions have gone through all kinds of stuff to get it qualified, but it turns out CMS already relaxed that. Wherever you are can be an originating site. So it says, my organization is asking us to fill out a new waiver form so that we could be credentialed to provide care from our home to the location of care. Is that necessary to bill at this time? It's probably not necessary for billing, uh, but it sounds like that's what the institution is doing to be highly, pro highly protective of themselves and their worry about audit and compliance. But Medicare says no problem uh, for the majority of us who are not sitting in institutions like that, uh, and selling mine has not said anything like that. Um, they're having struggling to keep the VPNs running, but um, you can do it from anywhere. Uh, Ancor uh, and, and Manasa, what is the best way to schedule patients, and how many can you reasonably see in half day? So I've been scheduling patients uh, similar to how I do my clinic visits. My um, We've established sort of a protocol for which patients we feel are um, amenable to a telemedicine visit, both established and new patients, based off of what we think we can get from our exam through video. And then my practice uh, assistant basically schedules them as a video visit on Epic, um, as Dr. Repka was talking about. and and. Right now, we're starting off pretty slowly because in, for new patient visits, we have to at least achieve, if we're gonna go based off of time, we have to at least have a 20 minute visit or a 25 minute visit if we're gonna bill for level two or three. I'm spacing them out at least by 30 minute inter intervals because I'm doing the, um, from start to finish on my own. So that includes the history, past medical history, going back to your medical school days and essentially writing a soap note on your own. Um, so because of that, I'm, it just you know however much time i've allotted for this i do it in an every 30 minute interval um alejandra the one of the pre-questions we got about this coding which um, i failed to mention and this is a downside for those of you that are looking for the um the needle in the haystack is that if you do bill a new visit a level one or a level two when you see that patient in the office the next time even though you've never seen them before they are now established, and your codes will be in the established family, uh, which if you look at from a revenue point of view strictly, not all the other advantages, uh, you'll lose some money on that. And Ancor, for you, um, they want to know if you can describe a little bit more the screen sharing technique uh, when you're seeing a patient uh, with the like Elmo video example. And what, while you uh, answer that, uh, there's a lot of questions about handouts and slide decks, and we will make those uh, available. The handouts are already there, and we'll also um, make the, um, the slides available. And I believe there's a recording as well. Great. Um, so as far as the screen share is concerned, um, there are different ways to do that. Essentially, what I do is I just go to YouTube, and you can find a video of anything you want. So one kid last week had one at Peppa Pig, uh, another kid liked Elmo, and a third liked Mickey Mouse. Um, so whatever you want to use, um, and then just screen share. Zoom does that very easily. Our SBR platform does it nicely. Um, so you just have to know your hardware, uh, I guess know your software, sorry, and, and make sure that you know how to do those screen shares. Now, the other thing that I've used the screen share for is, is showing our uh, images of the eyes and, and counseling about surgery, for example. And um, I've also in the past used it to show CT scans um, and follow up lab results and things like that. So these screen shares are really nice. One of my urology colleagues actually shows a doodle, like uh, a doodle program and then uses his pen tab to draw on it when he's counseling patients to do a preoperative evaluation prior to a, a urological surgery. And so th that I thought was just ingenious because he can be drawing and talking and, and everybody sees the same thing, just like in the office. So again, innovation, it's time um, to, to use this stuff and, and all these ideas that can cross pollinate are, are just gonna make us better doctors and make our patients feel better about things. One of the other things we've been doing, and it was mentioned with the Go Check Kids, if your pediatrician is seeing those patients for the initial encounter, and they do have a photo screener or a Go Check Kids app, 
um, you can start communicating with them and ask them to do a photo screening or a visual acuity, even if the child is going on for a sty or cellulitis or something else, so that then when they send the referral to you, you have that information available and then you can do the external exam or by other means. So remember our uh, primary care um, providers have many of those in their offices and if they're already seeing the, the patient in person, they can use them even if they're not doing a visual acuity screening or, or, or vision screening for that appointment. So if you can send a message to your um, pediatric um, providers um, to, to, to try to use that equipment that they already have uh, in helping to provide additional information for the, for the referral. Manasa, can you remind us what are the app, what are the platforms that allow for um, uh, share of the screen? So um, the Zoom platform certainly does, Skype does, and uh, Google Hangouts, the free platforms. If you um, get the DoxyMe Pro version, that also allows for screen share. And um, there's a, a question about liability um, that I can't find anymore. I think it had to do with um, if there's any any concerns about not being able to do a posterior poll. There was a question for Anchor when you were evaluating the uh, trauma patient that you couldn't see like uh, iritis or you know. Um, the iris irregularities. So, any question, any problem, any issues with liability about doing an incomplete exam? I guess. So that's why the liability, at least putting in the caveat to the patient's mom or dad that this is an incomplete exam, and you just can't be sure that if you aren't sure, then this is the patient you've got to bring in. So you know that's the acute esotropia in the eight-year-old with nausea and vomiting, uh, you know, we can document the esotropia, uh, but we do need to, that's, that's simply the patient who has to come in. But we won't, but what the person is asking is, there will be somebody in between you're not sure of, and I would say, you do the liability, and then you keep monitoring that patient, and if they get worse or they change, then you have to send them to the hospital. Uh, it's Another not a perfect situation. I mean, it's imperfect. If there's a certain amount of time that needs to pass between the, the two telemedicine visits or between a telemedicine visit and an office visit? A telemedicine visit, if it's coded with the 992 series, could occur today and you can do an office visit tomorrow. If you do the check-ins and some of the other online documentations, there are much stricter rules. For instance, if you did a online, you did a Zoom just to talk to the parents, and then you've decided on, you're coming in tomorrow, that's not billable. Uh, but if you do an exam, that turns out to be billable, uh, even if you see them the next day. But obviously, you do what's the ethical and moral thing to do there. Um, it may be nice to do the audio video and then decide to bring them in and say, you know what, that's just going to be tomorrow's exam. Uh, Mana, so they're asking if you could share the instructions that they're uh, providing to the patients. I, I think, Anchor, you can also mention, uh, we all mentioned that there's a lot of preparation that may need to happen ahead of time. We talk about consent, instructions for the parents, visual acuity instruction, and printout. So there's definitely some preparation that um, helps uh, in advance. And if um, some of you already share those handouts and, and, and maybe um, the others can as well. Uh, I, I don't know, we're at, at the 90 minute uh, mark now, so um, there's a lot of other questions. I, I'm not sure about the rules in terms of, um, Scott, are we gonna get all kicked out? No, we won't going? kick you out. <laughs> all right, well, let's go through a, a couple more questions. Um, I do wanna be respectful of everybody's time because I'm sure there's town halls and task forces and things to attend. Um, Let's see, um, can we go through the aspects of the exam and ask the panel which of there are possible pupils, pen light, um, exam, red reflex, uh, uh, motility, cover and cover, et cetera? Um, Those all sound good. Uh, you might be able to do, have the parent do fields. Um, and there are a lot of things you can do creatively. Encore was showing what you could do, but uh, you just can't do posterior segment. Um, and can you do it as well as you do in your own office? Not a way, no way, but it's certainly way better than nothing. Evan or Ancora, do you have um, comments about, can you check pupils, red reflex, 
or any tips or tricks that you want to share before we leave? I think the I have not yet been able to figure out how to do a red reflex. Perhaps you know, in a in a blonder, like less pigmented child, um, taking a picture and straight on and and having the parent show it to you with uh, just you know holding it up or or emailing it to you may be one way. But I don't know how reliable that's going to be. I think that's very hard. I think for pupils, yes. You know, the blue-eyed and the, the green-eyed, the hazel-eyed individuals, it's easy to see. And someone like myself, it's it's very difficult to see. Um, but what you can do is, is leverage a flashlight at home or the flashlight feature on their phone to illuminate those things. I showed you guys some examples of, of side illumination where the window was to the side and the light's coming across. And I think that has um, actually just in the last week taught me that I can get some anterior chamber stuff um, it's not it's not great, but it's better than nothing, as Dr. Repka said. Um, what else? Uh, visual fields. I've tried to teach parents and, and people like, you know, start out here and just tell me if you if you can see it. Um, I think those are with the older children and, and young adults that that I see and obviously the adult patients. Um, David Hunter actually this week uh, did his entire clinic virtually. And he has a heavy strabismus clinic and um, told us that he asked the patients to describe the separation in their diplopia as they looked in different directions of gaze and got a relative idea of that sensory motor examination. Motility is very easy in cross cover testing, self cross cover testing. It's hard to do, but sometimes you can get it. I have a microtrope that I was able to see them cover the, the fixating eye and like it just popped out a little bit. I know my last measurement was about six prism adapters by simultaneous cover testing. It looked roughly the same and I reassured the mom it looks fine. Um, so I think there are all these different ways um, that we can do things that you know are just coming along and, and we're gonna think about it as we do more of these visits. Thank you. Uh, one last question then, uh, for Mike. Also yeah, the one more thing, um, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, but Jagger Corner uh, mentioned um, in the questions as well that um, if you use nine gaze and turn the flash on, it actually gives you a pretty decent uh, Hirschberg and red reflex. Um, so in preparation for your visits, you can have your patients email you a nine gaze um, photograph uh, montage, uh, and that would get you motility and maybe a red reflex in Hirschberg as well. So the one thing I was just going to say is that sometimes these um, the, our, our smartphones actually have a anti-red eye feature already put into the camera. So you just have to ask the parents to go through their phone settings on the camera and just un disable the, an the, the red eye feature because you actually want that. Um, and then one other thing for when we're testing motility and visual fields, one thing that I learned very quickly from my own trial and error is that you as the examiner obviously can't be um, holding the target or um, doing the visual fields, because if you remember, your patients are looking at you through a small screen, and so their field of view that you're providing them is very small. So you need to utilize parental support in order to be able to do those two aspects of the exam. One other quick, uh, one other quick thing that Evan reminded me of is, is the light reflex. So I talked to you guys about talking to the camera itself, but having the child look directly at the camera or the adult and then getting that good natural lighting coming in gives you that light reflex. And that corneal light reflex, then you can use to estimate how much the isotropia might be or the exotropia as Evan is making it. Oh boy. <laughs> wow. Um, that was, that was uh, impressive. I think you're coming in. Get on a flight. <laughs> I'm already in my plus sixes, so I'm good. Talking about yeah. being in different states, people are asking if your patient is in a different state. Is an established patient who lives in your state, but because of this crisis, they're somewhere else. Is that considered interstate? Can you still call them or do an any visit? You can do so. That was what I tried to mention on the licensure, and do look at those two URLs. And it depends. In many places, you cannot. Uh, so, for instance, in Maryland, I can't do one in the three regions right around me yet, although each of the states say they're changing it. Uh, but telehealth is restricted. You can't be seeing a patient, even if they're established in providing a true service. 
in, um, say, for me in Pennsylvania. Uh, now, I can call my patient and tell them what they should do, but I can't be trying to tell them that I'm doing actual healthcare visit. Uh, that would be in violation of my licensure or lack thereof. So unfortunately, that has not kept up, uh, and but hopefully we'll get better. And they're asking if they're gonna also waive the HIPAA com uh, compliant issues with uh, email that is not HIPAA compliant, email communication. Uh, so most email systems, uh, um, are allowed now for texting, and uh, those are on the list on the slide that I had. Uh, but if for for most intents and for all intents and purposes, email is also allowed during this crisis. All right. Um, there's a lot more questions. I think I'm going to let everybody go, and then maybe we'll come up with a way of doing this again. Um, but I think we we answered most most of the questions and, and there were a lot of questions and as you all know we uh, had a, a record number of attendees and it sold out pretty fast so hopefully this was very useful for the audience i don't know if anyone wants to add anything just hang in there everybody stay safe and healthy please thank, thank you. you thank you Bye. thank you stay safe